we sit here with a lot of potentials. Potential sensations in the body, potential qualities in the mind. And the practice of meditation is learning how to develop skillful potentials in the mind. Learning how to take advantage of the useful potentials in the body and putting aside the ones that are not useful, and learning how to take advantage of the skillful potentials in the mind, learning how to feed them, give them strength so that they basically take over. You could, if you wanted to, sit here and spend the whole hour thinking about all kinds of things. You could sit here in a lot of pain. Psychologists who study the nervous system have discovered that there are many times when you have a sensation of pain and there's really nothing coming in at the end of the nerve, but the, the monitoring stations along the nerve interpret a particular signal as a pain signal. And that's what they send on up the line. So you could sit here and focus on whatever potentials for pain there are, but you don't. You focus on the potentials for pleasure. Notice when the breath comes in where it's feeling good, which part of the breath cycle feels nicest. Is it the middle of the breath? The beginning of the breath, the end of the breath. Can you notice when the breath is getting too long? Can you catch yourself squeezing the breath as it goes out? When you do that, you're harming the potential for pleasure that the breath can give. Some place in the middle of the in-breath, there's a point of balance. You might want to focus your attention there and maximize that, that particular sensation, which means that the breath will get shorter and shorter, more and more subtle, as it hovers around that point of balance. If that's too subtle to notice, simply be aware of when the breath is too long, when it's too short too shallow, too deep, which parts of the body would feel best, would feel better if they were given more of a role in the breath process. Try to figure out what way of breathing will help to develop the potentials of comfort, ease, refreshment, fullness in the body. And as you do this, you're developing the good potentials in the mind as well. The two major ones are mindfulness and alertness. I read recently where someone was saying that mindfulness is an unfabricated phenomena. Your thought processes are what are fabricated and pull you away from the present moment. But when you're in the pure present, there's no fabrication going on at all. That's a major misunderstanding. Mindfulness is something you do. It's an activity. Alertness is something you do. It's an activity as well. It's a, and there are potentials in the mind that can either help the mindfulness or harm it. In other words, mindfulness is something you have to feed. It's not your simple awareness. It's the ability to keep something in mind. And the reason we don't understand things, the reason we don't see the connection between cause and effect is because we forget. The reason we can't stick with our resolves, say we're gonna, we decide we're going to stay here for a whole hour with the breath, and five minutes later you find yourself planning tomorrow's meal. thinking about events far away, 
What happened? You forgot. And why did you forget? Well, there was a blanking out for a moment or two. Because you weren't paying proper attention to the causes for mindfulness. The Buddha says there are two qualities that help mindfulness along, that feed your mindfulness. The first one is well-purified virtue. Virtue here means the intention not to harm, not to do harm to yourself, not to do harm to other people. Because you have harmful intentions in mind. Part of the mind goes along with them and part of them doesn't. Part of the mind doesn't. There's a conflict. And one of the mind's tricks for going along with a harmful intention is to allow itself to forget that it is actually harmful. If this becomes a habit, it's hard to develop mindfulness, because you're running up against these walls that the mind is very insistent that it wants to keep up. Your mindfulness runs up against them and gets deflected. This is why sometimes in Thailand, when before they meditate, they make a vow that I'm going to observe the five precepts, I want to stick with them. And I'm sincere in that that resolution. It's even easier when you have been following the five precepts. You reflect on your actions, there's nothing you regret. You don't have to go into denial. And that's way, that way it's easier for mindfulness to be continuous. But the simple act of resolving that you're going to try to be harmless in all your activities that can begin to create the right conditions for mindfulness. Harmless in what you do, harmless in what you say, harmless in what you think. Make that a principle that you want to hold to. The other quality that helps feed mindfulness is views made straight, straight in the sense that they're in line with the truth. Understanding that your actions will have consequences. That skillful intentions will tend to lead to skillful results. Unskillful t intentions will tend to lead to unfortunate results. And this is a principle that wasn't just made up some, by somebody. It's something that's been observed by people who've developed their minds to the point where they really can see what's going on. And on the basis of that, you realize generosity is a good thing. Gratitude is a good thing. Because people do have the choice to act skillfully or unskillfully. You have to be grateful for the times when they're skillful. Because when you think in this way, it helps to break down those barriers. When the mind says, I don't want to think about the Dharma right now, I want to think about sex, or I want to think about drugs, or I want to think about who knows what. And this part of the mind says, hey, you can't do that without consequences. You've got your first line of defense against that, those wandering thoughts, those unskillful thoughts. And there'll be part of the mind that says, well, I don't want to think about that because I've been acting unskillfully in the past. And it just hurts too much to think about that. That's where the Buddha recommends, again, having the right attitude to your past actions. In other words, it's not inevitable 
that you're going to have to suffer a lot from your past mistakes. As the Buddha said, if you can develop an attitude of limitless goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, that will mitigate the results of your past bad actions. If you can train yourself so that the mind isn't overcome by pleasure, isn't overcome by pain. In other words, you don't let these feelings get in the way of your seeing what's actually going on. Then again, the mind is immune, or at least the results of your past actions are going to be mitigated. So the proper attitude to have towards your past past actions is one, realize that remorse is, <coughs> remorse is not going to undo them. Simply make the resolve. You're not going to repeat those actions again. And then you try to develop those attitudes of limitless goodwill, compassion, equanimity, empathetic joy. When the meditation gets dried, bring out these attitudes and work on spreading them around, realizing that other people's unhappiness is not going to help you in any way. Your being unhappy is not going to help you in any way. So why would you wish for anybody's unhappiness? Even people who have been cruel, unprincipled. You realize that if they suffered, they'd probably get even more cruel, more unprincipled. So try to picture them learning to see through the error of their see to the error of their ways and change their ways. In other words, you wish for them to start creating the causes for happiness. You don't feel that you have to settle old scores first before you let them be happy. Or you let them be wise. When you learn how to think in these ways, it helps to cut through a lot of the barriers that we create in the mind, a lot of the unskillful attitudes we'd have that would get in the way of our mindfulness. So when you've lowered the walls, then you can see back into the past and ahead into the future. And you can start seeing the connections between actions and their results. When you focus the mind in a certain way, what are the results over time? If you're mindful of your actions, you can really see this for yourself. If you change the way you focus, if you change the way that you breathe, what effect does that have over time? Sometimes the effects are immediate, sometimes they take a while to seep in. And only if you're really mindful can you see the long-term effects. Only if you're alert can you see the short-term effects. This is why mindfulness and alertness have to go together. I was reading a Dharma talk by Vasika Gee last night in which he was saying that real insight, as soon as it sees, it lets go. It's not that you see and then the next moment you let go. She says you see and you let go in the scene, right there and then. That kind of insight requires very quick alertness. But the ability to develop that kind of alertness requires good mindfulness, long-term mindfulness, so that you can understand how you get the mind in the right place to see things to begin with. All too often people sit and meditate and either goes poorly and have no idea why it's going poorly. Or it goes well, and they have no idea why it's going well, because they haven't been watching. They watch for a little bit, and then they forget, and then they come back, and then they forget. So they don't really see the connections. So mindfulness is what keeps the practice in mind, allows you to remember what you did so you can understand the connection between what you did and the results you're getting. Alertness is what allows you to see what you 
what you're doing right now. So when you develop these attitudes based on the resolve to act only on skillful intentions and the proper understanding of how your actions shape your life, those are the conditions that feed mindfulness, that allow mindfulness to grow. So it's not the case that people can just walk in off the street, sit down, and develop mindfulness. It takes the ability to look at your life, and make some decisions about how you're going to live, and how you understand the best way of living. That's when mindfulness has a chance. <laughs>